Welcome to Rising Woman Leaders, a safe space for women to thrive in community where their voices and stories are heard. We're a sisterhood supporting each other to live our dreams and embody the sacred feminine to restore balance on our planet. Join us each week as we return to the unconditional love and guidance of our heart and our womb. I'm your host, Meredith Rahm, and I invite you to walk this path of beauty, devotion, and service with us. Today we're celebrating the 100th episode of Rising Woman Leaders. It's been almost five years of releasing content to you, and there's so much I've learned on this journey. So many women I've had the honor of speaking to, interviewing on this podcast, and also so many sisters I've connected with in the community who've come to find this podcast. Just wanted to take a moment to thank you for being here and everything that's been able to be created together. You may notice that we created a new intro for this podcast. I really wanted to emphasize the importance of restoring balance of the sacred feminine in the, wo- in the world, especially now. I just really feel so deeply that this is the shift we are stepping into and experiencing together as a collective. I really started this podcast to be in devotion to the rising feminine, to allow the feminine to lead the way to reestablish balance in a new paradigm. My intention is that this podcast allows women to step into their sovereignty, rise in their feminine power, align with their autonomous, their free and boundless spirit to thrive in a new paradigm where the divine feminine and masculine coexist in unity. It's our desire for women to return to the unconditional love and the guidance of our heart and our womb, to remember abundance consciousness and rest into a deep knowing that there is enough for all of us and to embrace all of life and to feel our pain as a tool to reconnect and to realign with our innate divinity. We continually receive messages from our listeners telling us how this podcast has changed their life, how vulnerability and the openness of the stories of the women here have helped them feel so much less alone and so much more empowered. So today I wanted to offer an invitation to you if you have received spiritual nourishment in your life from this podcast if you believe in our mission of being in service to the sacred feminine and helping these women's stories get out into the world we invite you to become a patron and make a donation on patreon so patreon's a place where you can donate one dollar three dollar five dollars an episode your pledge supports us to continue creating regular free content and to fully devote ourselves in this mission of women rising and honoring the sacred feminine and women stepping into their unique brilliance we're so grateful for the community and all of us that have joined together the guests and listeners of the show have opened our hearts in ways beyond measure and if you want to give back and contribute to the community this is an awesome way to be involved. The way to do that is just go to patreon.com slash rising woman leaders. You can offer a pledge and you're welcome to decide however long you would like to be offering that monthly donation. This allows us to continue to hire support in releasing new episodes for the Rising Woman Leaders community. Today's episode in particular has a special place in my heart. I'm really excited for you to listen to this conversation. And before we dive in, I wanted to share a little bit more about my relationship to the honeybees and how this all started. So it was last October 2019. It was the very beginning of the month, maybe even the last few days of September. It was a Libra new moon, and I was outside working in the garden. We have this little pond in the backyard that hadn't been receiving a lot of love, and I was gardening around the pond, and we had bought this new gravel to put around the pond, and we'd been working hard all day. And at the end of the day, I was moving some pieces of wood from one place to another, and I felt a sting and I put down the wood and I looked at my hand and it was like slow motion seeing this honeybee on my finger and receiving this sting and just brushing it away and pulling the stinger out of my finger and it felt like everything was happening in slow motion. The moment was as if 
there was some greater message here. And so I was holding my finger and walking back to the house calmly and feeling like, okay, this is about to really hurt. And I could feel as the venom started going in and went up to the house and immediately went to find this tincture that I had just received probably only a week before, maybe a couple weeks before, from a healer that I work with in Sebastopol. We had just started doing homeopathy together. She had given me as a gift these three tinctures. One of them was specifically for bee stings, and it's called Latum. I used the tincture, and it was like within 10 minutes that was able, the sting, the pain of the sting was able to go away and I was just left really sitting with the medicine of what is being asked of me here. I have also had just discovered that this healer I was guided to work with was a beekeeper as well. So I was sitting in meditation and thinking about the honeybees and asking my friends, what do you know about the honeybee consciousness and what is the medicine of the honeybees and started learning more about how they're connected to the sacred feminine. And also how receiving a sting from them can be seen as an initiation into their sisterhood. And that right now the honeybees are actually looking for people to speak out on their behalf. The very next day that I got on a flight to go to the big island of Hawaii for my first time, where I went to celebrate my friend Kelly's birthday, and she had gathered a group of 12 women. It was like total hive consciousness to come together and celebrate and also uh, we didn't know it at the time but she had just broken up with her partner and so the week when we arrived ended up also being a time to really hold her in that grieving process and so there we were working together embodying that feminine essence really holding each other through that initiation with our friend and one of the women there Another dear friend happened to be a beekeeper as well and had been keeping the bees at Esalen, which is an amazing center and community in Big Sur, California. So she happened to bring with her a book called The Song of Increase by Jacqueline Freeman. And I started reading that book there and just feeling like, oh my God, this There is this deep calling to me from the honeybees to learn more. And I started learning more about all of the horrible things that are happening to bees right now in the world. And you may know that the honeybee population is really collapsing, that there is something called colony collapse going on in the world and a lot of honeybees are dying. And I don't actually think it's very much of a mystery. I think we actually know uh, what is at the root of this. After I did more research, I watched a documentary called Queen of the Sun that was really informative. But I learned that some of the things going on in commercial beekeeping right now is they're not allowing the natural ancestry of the hive to continue It's very common practice now in commercial beekeeping that the queen of the hive is replaced every year. She's actually picked out of the hive, killed, and then a new queen bee from another hive, another part of the country or a different country altogether, is put in a cage and then put in the hive. Because if she wasn't in a cage, the hive would see her as a stranger with a strange scent and not know who this bee is and they would kill her and so the hive itself is grieving the loss of their queen and are being forced to have a new queen in the hive we can think of the hive more of like a consciousness a one organism together and when you remove a bee from the hive like that It's like taking out an organ. It's like the organism itself goes through such a difficult time when you take the queen especially out of the hive. And this is a very normal commercial beekeeping practice that's happening all over the world. 
it's heartbreaking as I started reading more about this. There's also, bees are so affected by monocropping in the world. Monocropping is when one plant is being created in a huge way, like we see this in the U.S. with corn or with almonds or raspberries. It's like one form of a plant is just being grown in a huge scale. And what this actually does is it there's no diversity in that ecosystem. And the honeybees are brought in to pollinate the fields to continue this growth. And it's really horrible to see what's happening with the almond industry and the honeybees that are shipped in from all over the country to pollinate these huge fields. It's actually very difficult on their immune system because when they're only having pollen from one type of plant, they're not able to fight off and have as much diversity in their own innate health and immunity to different mites and diseases that they become more susceptible to. Not to mention the pesticides that are happening. I think of this in Sonoma County where I live and the wine vineyard fields and how much pesticide use is being used. It's like we need our pollinators, the bees and the butterflies, to be pollinating these flowers to continue their growth and we're poisoning them with the types of pesticides that we use and it's really affecting their immune system and their ability to create honey and everything that they need to thrive in their communities. Yeah, one other thing that I'm starting to open to is just the, the EMFs that's happening in our world from cell phones and Wi-Fi and all the different things that Bees are so sensitive to that unseen world and the different wavelengths, and they really connect with each other on sound frequencies. So what's happening in the world with EMFs and the 5G networks that are coming, it's really crazy to think about. It really makes me wonder as humans, at what lengths are we going to go? How far are we going to go? using Mother Earth and her resources and her animals on this planet that are here to support us in our involvement, at what lengths are we going to go to just hurting them and harming them for economic gains? That really, to me, speaks to the imbalance in our planet of how out of balance we've been in choosing the masculine of productivity and accomplishment and achieving and making more and we want the charts to keep going up and we want to keep making more money and at what lengths will we do that the sacrifice of mother earth and the honeybees and our planet so i think we are all in a deep inquiry right now of everything being stopped to really think about this and how we might be able to make a shift and a change moving forward so in this episode, we talk about the honeybees and the direct connection to the archetype of the priestess, to the planet of Venus, to the energy of the sacred feminine. We talk about the priestesses of Melissa and Delphi. We talk about the beauty, the rose, the healing of the womb, how the honeybees teach us about eros and sacred sexuality and connecting with our bodies and our hearts, and also how we can be a steward for the bees and for Mother Earth. I'm really excited to share this episode with you today, and if this is new information for you, I just invite you to dive deeper. I'll put some more information for you in the show notes of how you can learn more. I'm here today with Ariella Daly, who is a natural beekeeper living in Northern California. She fell in love with bees in 2010 when a swarm of wild bees moved into the wall behind her bed. Soon after, she began top bar and waree beekeeping. Ariella teaches and speaks about natural beekeeping, the honeybee organism, and the human relationship to bees. She believes that through learning to listen to the bees, we are learning to heal our disconnect from the natural world. Her work with bees is also informed by a decade studying European bee shamanism with the Lyceum in England. This tradition holds the honeybee as its central motif and ally. Ariella works with bees on both a practical, wineric, and intuitive level, encouraging people to explore the world of bees through the use of all of our senses. Thank you for being here. 
Thank you so much. It's an honor to get to be a guest here and be in service to the honeybee and the yeah. feminine. Yeah. Uh, it's so nice to get to have this time. We, we were just connecting for a while before even starting the recording of just how we came to find the bees and you know insights that are coming from that. And I think where I'd love to start is just ask you, like, how did the bees come to you? <laughs> More about that story <laughs> of them behind your bed. <laughs> yeah, of course. It's um, it's such a unique and universal story. I've been really interested in the way myth and mythic living weaves through our lives. I've been just wildly interested in Martin Shaw's work lately. And so it's been on my mind a lot of, of the way we can start to perceive the living myth moving through our lives. So I invite any of you who, who are listening, if you ever had a profound animal encounter to start to look at the, the way that created, I don't know, story and myth in your life that's informed you. Cause we were before this call, before the recording, we were talking about, um, different ways that that's happened for both of us. So for, for me, it's you know, my own unique story, but I think many of you might relate to various encounters with beings in this way. I was, I was beginning a process of descent. And what I mean by that is my introduction with bees came just before the hardest and darkest point in my life, and they got me through it. I had just come out of a five-month program that I created with some friends. It wasn't actually a, like an accreditation program, but it was based out of a wilderness program called Sierra Institute. A number of us as alumni went on a five-month backpacking trip, and I fell madly in love with one of the wonderful participants. And... Um, then got my heart broken when I came out of the wilderness together. Sometimes these things don't translate as anybody who's traveled with someone and fallen in love and then tried to make it happen in the real world has noticed perhaps, um, you know, different for everyone. But in that heartbreak, he gifted me a book called The Shamanic Way of the Bee, which was about a bee tradition in England called the Path of Pollen, which is now known as the Lyceum. Lyceum just meaning school. And it sent me down this very circuitous path of, of just knowing that I had to go there. And I <laughs> I couldn't afford it. I had no way to go. But through a series of synchronistic events, we call the, the queen bee in our tradition, the queen of synchronicity, I, I ended up getting on the wait list and having a free ticket to England and a free tuition to the program while I was, while I was um, seeking my way to get into the program. I thought, well, I've never been around honeybees. I got to go be, be around honeybees. I've never even kept a hive. I've never even seen a hive. And so I went, um, I went to a, a man named Mikhail Thiel who is an international beekeeper and works beautifully with rewilding honeybees. He actually ended up living where I live now here in Sebastopol. So I came to this area <laughs> and accidentally. I met him too. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a wonderful. total, it was a total synchronicity. Like I'd seen him, you know, in, um, I don't know if you've seen that documentary film about the bees, but I had known who he was and then it ran into him in the mark in the parking lot of community market. And I was like, <laughs> are you? <laughs> yeah. Yep. He sure is. And he's become <laughs> a dear friend of mine. I could have never, never foreseen that, you know, one of, one of our friends or one of the, the women that I know in this field of natural beekeeping, Heidi Herman uh, she's part of the National Beekeeping Trust and put together the Learning from the Bees Conference. And she talks about us people who are interested in bees, not as beekeepers, but as bee people. And I love that because there's this sense with the honeybees of this interconnectivity and there's this tapping into that hive quality that starts to 
bring in synchronistic connections constantly to the point of like, you just want to start laughing and giggling all the time because it keeps happening. And that's what happened with Mikael. I ended up at a, not even a beekeeping class, but a class about the, the heart of the honeybees and our heart connection to honeybees. And I ended up accidentally covered head to toe with bees and had one of those ecstatic like, transformative experiences of literally like dancing and moving with bees covering my body. And after that, I just knew I was on the path of the bee. And of course, the gates opened and I ended up, you know, the 14 people dropped out of the program that I was going to be on. And I ended up in England. And while I was in England, a wild hive of honeybees moved into cavity behind my bed so that when I returned home, I was living in with bees they were in the walls so i was dreaming with bees and living with bees right there and i got to spend a, about a year with them i started building a hive i built a top bar hive by myself well not by myself i had help because i didn't know how to build but i did it and in the in the midst of all of that and all of the ecstasy of being around bees i also got pregnant I knew I was going to get pregnant. I had been given the message. I was deeply connected with the bees um, in that process. And I was in meditation with them. And the child, at about 11 weeks, asking the child who she was, and she sent me an image of Delphi, which is where um, the ancient bee priestesses, the Melissa, had their... Of the, the apex or the golden age of the honeybee priestesses was at the time of Delphi, which actually was about a thousand years and was um, part of the pre-patriarchy Greek culture, pre-Hellenistic -pre Greek culture. She sent me an image of Delphi and the oracles. And in the moment I received the image, I started to bleed. And I was hospitalized and I went through a traumatic miscarriage and um, it started caught a swarm of bees about 10 days later. And I think that that swarm kept me alive, honestly. I really do. Um, the combination of that and, and music, because um, energetically I was bleeding out and I, I was so distraught. Mm. I think some people can go through a miscarriage and it's just a biological process, but for me it was losing a dear, dear, dear soul. And no matter how much I tried to understand it, I, I couldn't get past loss. And the, the bees midwifed me through a death process. Mm -hmm. So I am indebted to them for the rest of my life. I, I went through postpartum depression. and I learned through working with them the power of nature to heal and to bring us back to our bodies. And I'm so dedicated to helping other people have that connection and find that connection in your woven spirit and the natural world and the physical body and the um, liminal experience of life. Mm. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. It's, it seems like the bees in particular, I've heard several stories of them helping people through trauma related to the womb could you share more about that it's just their connection to the womb and healing the womb yeah how long do you got <laughs> <laughs> yeah um well there's a lot of different ways i could go with that but for one ancient cultures particularly when we're talking about honeybees, when I'm talking about honeybees, I'm specifically speaking about Apis mellifera, which means the honey-gathering bee. Uh, apis meaning bull. Uh, the bees were perceived as being born of the bull. And this is coming out of particularly ancient Greek culture, which was prior to what we think of as Greek culture and the Olympian gods. Pr prior to that time, it was a predominantly matrilineal and matriarchal culture. Um, this is like no in Crete. You had the bull worship uh, culture where the bull was connected with the mother, the mother goddess and the moon and life. And interestingly enough, in the 
constellations, we see a reflection of the Taurus, which is up right now in the sky, and, as the bull, and then these this little cluster of seven stars that many of us know as the Pleiades. Well, in ancient Greek culture, it was said that bees were born of the bull. You actually find this in um, even even further further back. Bees were connected to the bull, meaning connected to the sacred feminine form of life, life issuing forth from the sacred feminine and from the earth herself. And that in the spring, the bees emerged from the bull or from the sacred feminine, from the womb of the earth. And at the same time in the heavens, the seven sisters, also the seven bees, emerged within the constellation of the bull, as above, so below. So we have it mirrored in our ancient myths and legends, as well as just humans' ability to perceive the earth as mother, the earth as womb, and from the heart of the earth, the heart of the caves, the heart of the trees came forth these beings that brought honey and eros and healing and the flowers bloomed when the bees arrived and there's this long association between the bees eros as in um, love and sexuality mm. and honey as in um, a blessing and an aphrodisiac and uh, a way to connect to poetic language and the feminine which is mm -hmm. the womb and lastly, I'll say that within the shamanic tradition that I am part of, the honeybee is a central motif, but the all the healings and the workings really issue from the womb. We do so much breath work with the womb, healing with the womb, healing our own wombs, and then also using the womb as a source, a generative source of power to create healing for others, the earth, etc. Mm -hmm. So interesting. And so Taurus is also ruled by Venus, which I was speaking to you about before. And the Venus energy is, is that sacred feminine. It's the beauty. It's, I mean, when I think about the bees and their relationship with the flowers, it's like flowers exist to just to be in the beauty and it's like the bee the flowers would not exist without the bees the bees would not exist without the flowers it's just like so that essence of of yeah it's so important like the whole the energy of of the feminine being infused in our earth and just like that matrix being created and them weaving their webs all around i just it's so I think about the bees too with my work and path of the priestess. You know, I think of the priestess as one who's a vessel for divine, one who brings formless into form, one who is here to hold a frequency of love. And I see so much of the bees like doing that work. It's like they're holding a frequency on our planet right now. They sure are. Yeah, so beautifully said. I love that description of the priestess. It, I think that we're having such a moment of the, the rise of the feminine, even in the midst of this, this you know, global situation we're in with COVID-19 or the crown, the corona virus. We are experiencing the earth speaking to us and... I, gosh, you just nailed it right there. The importance of beauty. We've forgotten. Beauty becomes so superficial in our, in our kind of current society and how we, what we value about beauty. But if you go back and you go deeper, that's, that is one of the expressions of the earth is, is beauty. And what is more beautiful than a field of wildflowers or the perfect rose just like dripping in summer heat? When we, when we touch into that beauty, that holds so much about life force. It holds, and it holds the sacred sexuality, which I think is maybe part of the Venus energy that you're talking about is this reclamation of the importance and the potency of sacred sexuality that goes beyond it being about you and another person and more about that divine 
energy that can rise up through you that we witness when the bee is fully immersed in the petals of a rose. There's something so erotic about that, but it's, it's not, it's both personal and impersonal. Like how can sexual energy be impersonal and be used to cultivate good in the world and cultivate healing? We forget that that energy can be such a powerful form of healing when it's not directed at one person, but more like your garden or your art project or the way you move in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I got just little chills, goosebumps while you're speaking. It's just, yeah, it's exciting to just think about this energy. And um, I know, I imagine so many women listening to this podcast that just like feel that something is probably awakening of like, yes, I, this energy. Um, and, you know, we've been so out of balance for so many, like so hundreds of years. And um, I know right now, as I've been doing more research, there's a lot that's hurting the honeybees right now and um, things like commercial beekeeping and monocrops, um, pesticides. I wonder if there's anything you want to speak to of just like some of the challenges bees are facing right now and how your work, you know, the work that you're doing, just how do you, how do you work with that? And like, what solutions are you working with right now in your personal involvement? Mm, good question. Thank you for taking the time to do the research. You know, honeybees are an indicator species, meaning they are the clarion call. They are the bells clanging for those with ears to hear it. And they speak of imbalance, just like the birds in Silent Spring. There are many species like this, but for some reason, honeybees have taken a central role. Um, I say that as if it's a mystery to me, but it, it resonates. It makes sense in some deep level that, of course, it would be the honeybees. Uh, I've even, I think it was Rudolf Steiner predicted that the mechanization of modern beekeeping through the hive that most of us think of as a, as a beehive called the Langstroth hive, that within a hundred years it would, it would begin the downfall of honeybees as a species. So how to reconcile all of the harm done to honeybees. It's on, we do this on so many levels. One is, you know, changing the way we keep bees and, I think that includes changing the hives, we the type of hives we use, rewilding movements like uh, Deborah Richmond and Rewilding Our Planet is doing some great work with that. Uh, Mikhail Thiel is doing some great work with that, the Natural Beekeeping Trust, uh, shifting how we perceive bees, shifting the language we use around bees. For instance, not calling a honeybee female a worker bee that factory era thinking, but shifting our language to the female or the maiden or the sister bee. I think that on a large scale, they're asking us for a full rewrite. And that is going to happen from the bottom up and is being in some ways demanded of us right now as we all pause, as we all try to figure out. And I, I say pause um, and I, I want to just acknowledge that many of us are pausing and have to and are in a place of privilege where that's okay that we can actually just be at home while so many people um, are on the front lines and not able to pause and it's a very stressful time but as a whole just the slowdown with travel and traffic and all of that that's one way that the earth is making us address this I think being educated about what actually happens with honeybees and the major large-scale pollination events. Just start to read about what happens in California in February with the almonds mm -hmm. and basically animal abuse and, mm -hmm. you know, coming to terms with what, what's happening with your food. Planting for pollinators becomes one of the best ways you can serve the honeybees 
uh, I think backyard beekeepers, hobbyist beekeepers are essential. And I'd like to change the languaging around that because that languaging is in a response to, well, the normal beekeeper is a commercial beekeeper. And if you're doing anything else, you're a hobbyist. I don't think that's correct. I think we've always been living with plants and um, bees. And what is it to live with bees again? So I invite people to start living with bees. This is the last thing I'll say to this, but if that's the case, if you choose to start living with bees, then you are going to have to come to terms with choosing to live in direct relationship with death. Because while the bees symbolize abundance, fertility, feminine energy, expansion, they're also giving us such a lesson in death. And if you get bees, your bees will die. Not all of them, and maybe you'll find a colony that is is a survivor colony, and you'll be, you'll be able to breed that colony and catch swarms from that colony. Your bees are going to die. Mm. You're going to have to come to terms with that experience and what what they're trying to teach us through death, as well as life. Mm. Wow. Yeah. What has that been like for you when when your bees die? What, what lessons come through with that? So many. Um, you know, bees in, in in some of the ancient European cultures and, and Egyptian as well, bees are seen as psychopomps. It's a great word for uh, those who can usher souls from this world to the next. They are those who go between the veil, between the worlds, bringing souls both into incarnation and taking them to the other world, the afterlife. On a very real level, each beehive I encounter has a specific personality. And so it is like losing a friend. You get to know them. You want to save them. But um, so many of the things going on, like you go to a bee conference anywhere, everywhere, the big topic is how to keep bees alive, how to deal with this invasive species called varroa mite, which is taking bees out and causing all this disease, and how to do it despite all of the commercial beekeeping that's causing so much harm. And um, you know, I've done tons of research as to how to get there, but it's a slow process. And so in the meantime, it's, you know, little things like I work with using the whole hive when I lose a hive. I really intentionally, um, you know, I take time with the hive body. I process the wax. I um, cry with them. I talk to them. Um, I also often know ahead of time. They usually tell me in my dreams or through some of the uh, womb communication I do with them. They'll let me know. Often they'll let me know that they're dying and I'll ask if they want me to do anything. And sometimes I get permission and sometimes I, I don't. So learning to speak with the natural world is very helpful. Um, but that requires learning to connect in with our bodies and our own processes around grief held in the body. Yeah, and a lot of people right now, I think, are facing those those dark places. It's like we don't have all the distractions we used to have uh, to be out of our house and be around other people and all the things, travel the world. It's like we're being faced with just being still. And I think on a lot of levels, it's a really good thing, but also it can be really scary and... Um, something you had mentioned when we were um, communicating an email was just like the dark night of the soul and um, how we can connect with the natural world and the earth to help us through that. Anything else you want to speak to on that? Mm. Thank you for bringing that back around. In some ways, I feel that the dark night of the soul I went through when I miscarried in the following couple of years after prepared me for this because it was it was hard to stay tethered to my body and it, it took a incredibly potent moment in Glastonbury, England in the middle of the night for me to fully claim staying in a human body and I think that that's, that's part of it right now is how to be in a body when we're so afraid 
Uh, we're afraid that our body's going to get sick. We're afraid that people we love are going to die. It's a very, very common thing to dissociate out of the body when things get scary or when we have traumas or when things change. And when we go into stillness, our body gets louder because we have time to be aware of it. Uh, even if we're just sitting on the couch watching Netflix over and over again, something starts to shift. We start to become a little bit more aware of our body. And as we do so in relationship to what's going on on the planet, to me there's this this sense of the 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 hive is such an interwoven being that is so porous and so interconnected and that's what's happening to the hive of humanity right now is we're discovering how porous and interwoven and connected we are and how quickly this pathogen can pass between us and as a collective we are in the descent of the dark night of the soul which in every myth and every ancient story is the journey into the underworld it's the journey into the desert or out onto the sea or or deep into the forest where we know we won't return the same we know that some major process is going to happen if you look at the demeter core myth from ancient um from the pre-Hellenistic Greek cultures, well, actually that myth continued right into the Olympian gods, but you have the spring maiden, Kore, Kore literally meaning spring, and her mother Demeter, who is the mother goddess of the grain and the harvest and the seasons, and she gets abducted into the underworld, and there she doesn't stay Kore, she goes through an underworld journey and becomes the queen of the underworld known as Persephone and then starts cycling back out. So in the underworld, she's the queen of the underworld, and then she comes back up with Persephone and becomes, you know, spring blooms again, and then back to the underworld, and winter arrives. And we are in a collective winter, even though it's happening in the spring, where what happens on the other side, it, it requires a tenacity. It requires a death, multiple, many, many little deaths, um, on every level, including the physical, that that's happening. And, you know, every dark night of the soul, every initiation, every rite of passage has a tenuous, I don't know if I'm going to make through it, make it through it quality. And I, I think the, the earth as our mother is sending us into one hell of a dark night of the soul. And I don't think we'll be the same on the other side, but... In the hero's journey or the heroine, heroine journey, what's on the other side is what we're meant to be and what we're meant to become. Mm -hmm. So I have hope. I have hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any big initiation, like a woman giving birth or a, um, a young man going out on a vision quest, it's like we have to face all those parts in order for the transformation to happen in order to come back different to have the wisdom to be able to bring that yeah. into our lives and a dark kind of the soul and initiation is is incredibly personal but the return is for the village the mm -hmm. return is for the community and i just want to say that while it's it's beautiful to get to ruminate on this kind of stuff it's important to also acknowledge that you know there's a lot of people who who don't have that privilege because it's they're on the front line of this, um, and so I, those of us who who do perhaps have that time, how can we be of service and how can we be um, thoughtful and um, thoughtful to what's happening uh, to people who are maybe not feeling as safe or yeah. or just in a lot more hardship. Yes. I'm curious what the honeybees can teach us about harmonious living. And like when we do get to the other side and when we, even things we could bring into our lives now, but just things to think about what you notice about the bees and working with them so intimately and that sacred feminine energy and just how they live their lives and how could you see that reflected in our collective and our culture? Absolutely. Hmm. The hive 
at its heart is in many ways a, a womb. The hive centralizes, the colony of bees centralizes all of its energies around raising, protecting, and nourishing and caring for the brood, which is the, the babies, the larvae, the eggs, the babies, which is held in the usually the center of the colony and around it is pollen, which is uh, what feeds the babies, and around that is honey. And so they're, they're protecting this central most part, which is the brood and the queen, uh, who is a mother, who carries both the masculine and feminine energy within her, because a hive, of course, has masculine energy too. It has the drones, um, singers, beautiful drones. Uh, so there's, there's this quality of what can we do to return to protecting and caring for the, the the wombic qualities, meaning the generative, uh, creative places in our lives. There's also this understanding that a honeybee never has to question her purpose. She has so many roles in one lifetime, but she also knows that she has them and she has purpose. And she's, she's part of a super organism, meaning she can't survive on her own. We can't survive on our own. We're told to go into these very individual moments and, and places where we're perhaps, you know, in an apartment alone by ourselves in a major city somewhere or wherever we are. And yet realizing that we're completely interdependent on the systems that have been created globally with, with this thing that is the human experiment. Mm -hmm. So a honeybee knows that she knows that she's she's needed, and she has purpose. And maybe at first she's a nurse uh, or an attending the nursery, and then later she's building and becoming a builder and an architect of the uh, cathedral that is their home. And then later she, towards the end of the, her life, she becomes uh, a lover of the flowers and a forager. So we know we spend all the time asking what's our purpose, uh, participation participating in the human experiment is a big part of it. There's so many things we can draw from the bees and their way of living, but I think the biggest one is just recognizing the interconnectivity that we all have and that perhaps we are more interconnected even beyond the physical, that there's this great dream that we're all part of, this great dream weave, and that we, we are capable of really envisioning a world that is in right relationship with the natural world and our bodies and the health of all beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they, they work together just so harmoniously. And like you said, that interconnectedness of realizing, I think we're all realizing that right now, how connected we all are and how sad it is you know, just the the grief of having to be isolated right now, and it's like we we do need each other. Grief grief work is so important. You know, Joanna Macy's her book "World Is Lover, World Is Self" is a good one, and Sabam Fusume's work, uh, just for anyone who's looking for ways to be processing some of the grief. You know, we might it might feel like anxiety, but usually underneath that anxiety is sorrow or fear. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there any practices you want to share just around earth connection, earth consciousness, earth protection, anything that ways we can begin to cultivate or recultivate our relationship with the earth? Mm. Yeah, uh, let's see. Well, for those of you who, who don't know this about me, I do a tremendous amount of Wineric work, which is dream work. And uh, in the work I do, I teach about how we can intentionally dream. But beyond just an, setting an intention, we can dream with the spirit of the honeybee. We can dream with the spirit of the earth. And so just the invitation to start asking for that I tonight I want to, to dream with the earth is very very different than I want to dream about the bees or I want to dream about the earth it's um, inviting in a, a shared relationship that's already there but you're bringing it in with more intention so I do a tremendous amount of that that type of work both in my classes and personally breath work is another big one 
um, on, a, on a super simple, basic level, I work with inhale and exhale in relationship to the living planet, understanding that when we inhale, we are inhaling the exhale from the trees and from the green things, and that when we exhale, we are gifting back that natural exchange back to the trees and the green things. So starting to see that life force energy and exchange happening as you breathe in and breathe out. And for those with, for women and people with wombs or people who identify as women and want to work with the wombic consciousness, in the Lyceum ways, in the Path of Pollen, we, we work with the womb as the first brain, as the first place of consciousness. Often it's spoken of that, that we, a, a Melissa, a bee priestess, is she who speaks from between her legs. So bringing back this ability to drop into the womb as a place of nourishment and to drop into the darkness therein. We're afraid of darkness. Here you are going through a darkness of the soul. Well, what does it mean to actually really sit in a luminous black velvet darkness, that same darkness that births galaxies in our own body? Uh, so my suggestion would be, without, without going into kind of a longer practice, would just be to start breathing into to send your awareness down to the womb as opposed to the heart or even uh, the root chakra but it's very specifically the womb to breathe into that space to see that space as that dark vessel as that as that chalice as the library to womankind and start to feel what it feels like to breathe into that space. We, we intellectualize the womb a lot, but if you're a woman in the world at this time, you have invariably ingested or experienced some kind of trauma around the womb, whether that's passed down ancestrally or through cultural programming, societal programming, or through actual trauma. We have a, a, a divorcing of the lower wisdom of our body from the intellectual. So as we breathe into the womb, as we start to perceive that dark cavern and, and fill it with the life force from the trees and the green things, we start to form a relationship with what that part of the body has to say. And it can be quite cathartic for some, some people at first, a truly nourishing place to land in. Recognizing that as we breathe into the womb, we're also connecting to the womb of the earth that's supporting us. Wow. Yeah, it's so simple and accessible. And it's just, I love the threads between just like the dream world and our psyche and what we can discover, what messages we're receiving, and just how that directly impacts everything, the land we walk upon. They're so interconnected. I'd love to hear more around what your work looks like right now and what kind of offerings you're sharing and how you're in relationship with all of this and teaching. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> it's been an interesting kind of a pivot, kind of a little pirouette as we move into isolation but the reality is I teach so much online already, so it hasn't been a big stretch. I do this nine-month women's beekeeping program here uh, in Sebastopol, and that, that's that been really hard. We've had to, had to move that in-person program online for the April session. But everything else other than my you know in-person workshops where I bring people to me or I go to you know, places like France, everything else is online. So I do a teleconference style dream work class, which I've been teaching since 2016. I do both one that's just for women uh, called Dreaming with Bees and then one that's for all genders called Betwixt and Between. And I've found that doing dream work through teleconference is incredibly powerful. It, people connect so deeply because it, it's an auditory experience versus a visual experience. So there's this 
way of working with the imaginal realm as you listen that is quite different than a Zoom conference. Um, I'm also teaching, uh, so the next one for that, sorry, starts starts in April, but I teach it quarterly. The other classes I teach are one class called To Be Acquainted, which is about getting to know the honeybees and starting to understand them as a being and the natural beekeeping, of course. I do a lot of different things. I do one-on-one -on -one consultations. I do dream work sessions, shamanic dream work sessions with people where I have them doing dreaming. I do a process mirroring for them and then often do uh, my own seership work through the Lyceum ways to help um, give them guidance and, and nourishment. So that's a little bit. <laughs> it's a lot of different things. Thank you. Yes. And please send the link so I can include those in the show notes. That sounds really interesting, especially that one coming up in April. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask, there are sometimes just a qu couple questions I like to ask people just to understand more of just the person that you are and the life experience you've had. Um, one question I want to, I'm curious, just like what gives you hope? What helps you get out of the bed every morning? Humans give me hope. <laughs> Humans, you know, we, we have such a bad rap. We, we talk about what a problem we are, but we are incredible. We are imaginative beings. And um, I am just so constantly moved by humans and their ability to, again, pivot and find a way and we hear so much bad news, but there's so many, so many incredible things going on right now. We are so, so beautiful. Our imaginations are so beautiful. Our emotional range and depth is so exquisite. And, you know, just look at what's happening with Italy and people singing uh, or, or here in, in Marin, everybody howls at eight o'clock. No, Marin is a county south of me, but my friends down there howl at eight o'clock every night for healthcare workers or the people clapping in New York City at eight o'clock. There's just something so exquisite about our ability to heal each other and be there for each other and we forget that. And then the natural world, I'm lucky enough to live in a place that's very green. Um, and despite all the harm, going to the sea or sitting under an oak tree, I get so much hope from the fact that given the right conditions, life will always flourish. Life wants to flourish. And despite the scariness and the direness of climate change, there is this, I, you know, bees still go to the flowers, dolphins still play in the sea. And there is, there's hope in that to me. Life wants to flourish. Yes. I had dreams last night of swimming with humpback whales. And it was just like, oh. That's exquisite. <laughs> Whale dreams are the best. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I feel, wow. I feel like there, yeah, so many animals right now, they're here to help raise our collective consciousness. And like those, some of the water beings, like you mentioned, the dolphins. I have this year also had a big connection to the big island of Hawaii and swimming with dolphins there for my first time was just like oh. <laughs> wow. yeah. they are so wise. The dolphins <laughs> and the whales. They are they're my other kind of big connection animal. Whales, dolphins, orcas. I dream about them a lot. They're just exquisite. You know, People say all the time, what are you doing to save the bees? Or we have to save the bees. And it, it is a, I, I get it. Yes, I, I agree. And also, maybe they're here to save us. Maybe the bees got loud in human consciousness and we started studying them and the bee crisis became so loud because the bees needed to grab our attention so that they could help us yes. evolve. We can still evolve. We are still evolving. And that's what the animals need of us. So what if us, what if it's mutual? What if we mm -hmm. save ourselves and save the earth and the earth saves us all at the same time? Wow. 
Oh, I love that shift in perspective. Yeah. Um, another question I'd love to ask is just, what's um, a big fear that you've had in your life and how did you overcome it? Oh, I am so fears? living it right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am in the big fear. Uh, yeah, my big fear, my biggest fear is that I will not have a child from mm. my womb in this lifetime. Mm. And that's actually a very strong reality that, that that could happen. And I have to come to terms with that. Um, I pray every day for my family. And uh, <laughs> it's so funny. I always talk about like, the most intimate things on podcasts. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. But, um, here's the deal. In um, a year ago, I was going to uh, artificially inseminate uh, on, you know, get pregnant by anonymous donor. And due to health reasons, I had to put it off a year. So this February, I was going to do it. And then I ended up getting invited to go to Israel, which never happened because of coronavirus. So I put it off a month. And then I was going to try in March and coronavirus hit. And so mm-hmm. right now I'm in this place like, oh my gosh, what do I do? I, I don't have that much time left in terms of years of fertility left. And, and, and I was going to do this now. This was the time. Um, I, I'm in the process of choosing a donor and I'm, I just don't, I don't know. I'm scared. I'm scared of doing it in the midst of coronavirus. Um, I'm scared of, of never meeting a partner. I'm scared of miscarriage again. I am, uh, it's my biggest fear, just bringing life into the world and I'm going to try and go for it. I'm actually going to try and, crowd fund the, the fee uh, for which sounds so I don't know presumptuous but the only way I can figure out how to pay for getting pregnant and it's so ridiculous that I have to pay to get pregnant but mm. after six years of trying to meet somebody it's time mm. yeah yeah I hear that so that's my biggest fear <laughs> yeah no I've um, supported other women on that journey and it's just The longing to be a mother and to bring life into this world is just so deep and real and and scary (laughs) at the same time. Yeah, I'm not a mother, but I would love to be one day. And I think about that and I what I keep coming back to is just that there as much as we may be feeling that longing, there are souls that are feeling that longing to be here and to be the the ones that we need um, to you know help midwife this shift that we're in right now it's so true i was in a um, dream oracle session earlier this week or last week and i got the message while i was deep in the meditation we we do a form of meditation and then we utter um dream mirror oracles back to to each other and I saw so clearly, and this is going to sound kind of out there. Uh, I don't want to get too like crystal, crystal indigo children vibe here, but um, not that there's anything wrong with that. But um, I just saw that there is a spe- there are specific souls waiting for right now for the time of this transition to come through right now, and I felt them so acutely that they're they're right there and they're waiting and the that it's not the wrong time to have children, that it, we shouldn't be afraid to bring life into the world in the midst of this crisis, which felt so counterintuitive to all of my fears. But mm-hmm. you know, I, I really felt that for whatever it's worth. Yeah. My cousin had a baby just a few days ago, and it was just like... Congratulations. <laughs> I know, and I she's sending me pictures. You can't meet him yet, of course, but... <laughs> um, but it's just, I have that deep sense and that feeling of like this being like chose to be here at this time. And like the name that she chose is a, um, it's a Hebrew name that means messenger of God, um, Malachi. And it's just mm-hmm. like, uh, yeah, I feel that. I feel that in this child. I feel that in so many of the souls that are coming through right now. It's just like they are very awakened and um I think that's the feminine consciousness too, just 
it, it, life wants to persist and it's, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. I love my male friends and I love the men I've dated in my life, but a lot of them have said, I, I can't see bringing a child into the world in the state of the world. And while there's many men who look forward to being fathers, I, I just, I just want to give so much love to the, to the women who, who aren't, are afraid but are, are choosing to bring life in anyway because despite how it seems I think that there's there are souls like you said that are waiting to be here that are part of the change yeah. um, with with no malintent towards my beautiful male friends I, I can see what a yeah. struggle that must be and how scary that must be for them too yeah definitely what is a moment recently that you've had of just like beauty or awe? I'd love to hear just, uh, something that just like opened your heart or brought you to that space. Of yeah, wonderful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I... Well, I took the week off. I was supposed to go to Israel um, during the week of Equinox, and obviously I did not. So I took that week off from my work, and because I was home quarantined, I just spent so much time sitting with the bees. Because I was sitting with the bees, I was able to be present the moment my hive started to swarm. For those of you who are listening and don't know what that means, it means give birth. So the bees were swarming out of their hive, giving birth to themselves, leaving half the hive behind. And then the, the queen mother leaves with about half of her daughters and sons, and a new virgin queen is born inside the hive of there too so mm -hmm. I got to be there and that's the best way to actually start a new colony of bees is to catch a swarm these bees were swarming in this massive cloud um, it's so ecstatic it's it's an orgasmic birth and I was they were going way way high up in this oak tree and I started doing this thing called tanging. There's an old English folk tradition um, called tanging, which is where you, you bang, usually on metal, but some people use a drum, bang on metal. The traditional tool is called a coit, and it's just this repetitive, repetitive ding, 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 ding on metal. And I've, it's kind of one of those, like, is it a folk, like, is it an old wives' tale? Does it really work? I had tried it once the beast had already landed on a tree branch, and it didn't work. But when they're in mid-flight, they respond to sound sound is the building block of creation you know they say that perhaps it's the sound and the buzzing of the honeybees that actually helps form the hexagons that this, that this body structure is on mm. the comb i was able to tang ding 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 and bring the bees all the way down and i walked down to where i wanted to catch them and i brought them all the way down they started landing all over me and they ended up coalescing on this branch that reached over and it was, it was the easiest catch I've ever done. I just felt so much connection and communion and this reminder of, I guess we're back at the beginning to the song of increase. The swarm is that moment of increase and they are sound beings. We forget that. So are we. It's so beautiful to be in sound relationship with them and then be able to start a new hive like that yeah yes wow thank you for sharing that um do you have any any other closing words it's been such a joy to have you here i'm so excited to share this conversation and i just wonder as we wind down anything else that you want to leave people with and i think i'll just close with a short prayer after that Mm, great. Well, I want to say thank you, um, not just for this opportunity, but for the space that you create through your podcast and through your work to support the feminine and support the return of the priestess um, or the, the sacred feminine in the world. That We need these voices. So thank you for that work and for all the incredible women you keep bringing on your podcast. Um, for those of you listening, I would say 
this is a really beautiful time to return to a very simple and very intuitive practice of offerings that even if you can't start bees right now or plant a garden right now or go out in nature you know in the way that you might want to go out on hikes leaving leaving offerings for the natural world for the spirit of place for the spirit of the earth for the mother earth earth for that one oak tree in your yard or um or the falcon in that high nest and some beautiful, tall, high-rise. Offerings can be as simple as a written word on a piece of paper that you leave by the windowsill if you can't go outside, or um, a sprinkling of pollen at the base of an oak tree, or a gift of water that you've prayed over. It's such an old, intuitive human thing to do. Um, I really do believe that when we come back to that exchange of offering our gratitude and our prayer and our thanks to the greater than human world, we are heard. And that world is here to be with us, not to get rid of us. Mm. Yes. So let's just take that in. Everyone listening, I'll just invite you to soften if you can, you can just close the eyes and drop into the breath and just feel, feel that interconnectedness, everything, that essence of the feminine, the coming together, the how we all need each other, the weaving, the love, the beauty, the possibility, the hope, the desire to live, the desire to create and regenerate, and even just in this breath of uh, air that this Earth Mother has had in these past couple of weeks, just the amount of regeneration that happens so quickly, it's just uh, sinking into that. I'll just bring my hands to my heart and just thanking Ariella for all of her wisdom, for sharing, for listening to her intuition to be on her path and to teach and to help others. And for all of you listening, just your heart and your desire to contribute and to make this world a better place. I honor each of you and I bow much gratitude for these wild times we're in and how we can continue to find the beauty and the sweetness within it. Lots of blessings and namaste. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen to this episode. If you liked it, share it with a friend or leave us a review on iTunes. You can also follow along on Instagram at Rising Woman Leaders sign up for email updates at risingwomanleaders.com to be sure to receive all the new and inspiring content. Thanks again for being here. It's an honor to walk